Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. So we'll just get started as we wait for more people to join us. And uh, for the participants who have joined us here on Zoom and also on uh, Facebook, thank you so much for joining us. So we'll just get started. And uh, my name is Hezron Muyakin, and I'm a team player at Culture and also the founder of uh, Planet Wizard, which is a health magazine. So I'd just like to share a few ground rules before we get started. And that's please keep your microphones muted during the session to avoid interruptions. And also uh, put down your questions and concerns. Uh, they'll be responded to at the end of the session. So I'd like to introduce the uh, facilitator for today's session, my colleague, Dr. David Othiambo, will be taking us through the topic of uh, non-communicable but very lent a case for, of NCDs. So welcome, David. Thank you so much, Ezra. And thank you everyone for being part of these discussions. This is marking the ninth session that we're having since we started the Health Roundup. And it's a pleasure that we're learning together and we're growing together in comprehending some of these health matters and what the implication of the same are to us. So has already been introduced by Ezron. I'm Odiambo David, I'm a pharmacist by profession and I'm co-founder with the Reculture team and we drive a number of initiatives on improving health and improving the well-being of individuals in our communities. So today the topic as stated here is non-communicable but virulent, a case for non-communicable diseases that's NCDs. When you look at it from a perspective of non-communicable diseases, we all know about some or maybe we know someone who has suffered from a non-communicable disease and the starting point is, what are these non-communicable diseases? These are, from the term, these are diseases that can't be transmitted from one person to another, but at the end of the day, we still suffer from them. They're not infectious. For example, you can have malaria, which is infectious, by transmit, which is transmitted through bite of a mosquito. But in this case, these are non-communicable. There's no mechanism for transmission from one person to the other, but we still suffer from them. Examples are, we have diabetes, one of the, diseases that are fall within the class. We have cardiovascular conditions such as stroke, heart attacks, hypertension, heart failure. These are non-communicable among the cardiovascular. Mental health is one of the non-communicable diseases as well. And then other than that, we have chronic respiratory conditions. You have people who are suffering from asthma. You have people who are suffering from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So across all those scope of the disease that we have from cancers, diabetes, cardiovascular conditions, hypertension, and related. Then we move to chronic respiratory in infections and diseases. Chronic respiratory diseases, they're not infections. And even to all the other forms of mental health disease that we have, these are non-communicable. But the reason as to why we factor these as virulent conditions because the devastation, the level of impact that they have on us as members of the society, as individuals suffering from them, and people with loved ones who have gone through these conditions, it's a critical case. And it's something that it doesn't stop from not infecting you, but it affects you even when you're not sick with any of the non-communicable diseases. If you have a relative, a friend, a colleague who has suffered from any of these diseases, you remember, just imagine from an asthmatic attack, a person with you at the office, and this person is getting the attack early in the morning or mid-morning, and there's, they didn't remember to carry their inhaler. At that point, the crisis, the pain that that person goes through, it transfers to you, you feel the pain, and you wish you could make it better for them. But unfortunately, you might not be in a position to. And if you're in a position to, the first thing would be to look for ways that you can get them an inhaler to help them get relief. If you've ever had a relative, uh, someone close to you suffer from cancer, you know the pain they go through before they pass on at the last moment. The pain is severe, it's uncontrollable, but at the end of the day, there's no cure for these diseases. So how do we build a case and enable these people to get access to the quality care and the impact that it has on us as an individual, as members of the society, might be lessened. And that is what we are looking at. These are non-communicable diseases, but the impact they have on us as a society, as individuals suffering from them, is beyond control. And if we can make an impact, we can make a contribution towards stopping the pain and the anguish that these people suffer, and the impact of it on the entire society, we'll have made a progress. So if you can, you all can acknowledge, this week has been the global week for action on NCDs. It starts on 7th to 13th of September. This is the last day that we're having this session today. And these diseases have been there. And for the year, the focus, this year, the focus has been on accountability. What are the different driving factors when it comes to non-communicable diseases? What are the shortfalls and the gaps in investment for 
care for people with non-communicable diseases? And how do we drive that agenda forward to ensure that these people can have access to the quality care that they need? And beyond getting the quality care, we cushion each other so that we promote healthy living, healthy lifestyles, so that we have less people suffering from non-communicable diseases. Because if that happens, then it will be a win for us. So it's a whole investment and everybody has a role to play. Whether you have suffered from any of the non-communicable diseases, whether you have someone who has suffered, and if you don't, at least you have someone who has gone through probably in a distant relative to you. Personally, I have a case dealing with non-communicable diseases. One, as a pharmacist, I've attended to patients who need care. And when you, they need care, they remember mentioning in one of the sessions that we had earlier, I think that was session six, you can check it on your YouTube channel. I was talking about a um, program that we are trying to be put in place for NCDs at Kasarani Health Center. In this program, what we are looking at, most of the patients need medication, but as they, through the government supply system, the medicines are not there in the hospital. So how do we enable them get the medicine? Even if it can come in form of a social a safety net at the local facility level with the community stakeholders so that we have continuous supply of medicines, we'll have helped these people get their medications. So that's a program that we're trying to put in place. And if it takes off, at least the people who are suffering from non-communicable diseases at that particular location will be helped. That is my encounter as a professional in the healthcare space. Beyond that, I have my grandmother from the maternal side passed on in 2007. She had esophageal cancer. And it got to a point that what you know about non-communicable disease that they can't be transmitted to you, but the anguish, the pain that the people you love go through is unbearable. I remember that point, cancer care was not that much advanced. That was in 2007, but there were some interventions that were being put in place. And then that is where we now have different organizations, different business entities coming into the space offering hope. And when someone you love, someone you care about is suffering from a condition that you wish there was a cure, but there isn't any, you try anything that shows some hope. I remember my, my parents and my aunties and uncles seeking care to every other organization. There is an initiative called Tianchi. They were talking about natural remedies, supportive management and all. There was an investment from the family end to get all these supplements and anything they could, but it never helped. That was from 2005, 2006, and 2007. And then finally, she gave way, and we let, her, we let her go. Last year, but one, that was in 2017, I lost an uncle of mine to colorectal cancer. And it was one of the most devastating moments. You know someone is going, but there's nothing you can do about it. And this is the impact. I'm seeing it from a distance because this is my grandmother, not an immediate relative. From the, from the distance, the way it is, then now this is an uncle coming on. Then now as a healthcare worker, I have to see these people every single day. Someone suffering, but you have nothing you can do to them. But then as a society, we know the contributing factors. Within the healthcare space, we have an idea of how it feels and how the pain that these people are feeling can be lessened. How we can reduce the burden of non-communicable diseases. From study and evidence that is there, most of the inpatient hospital admissions up to 51% are as a result of non-communicable diseases. And up to 40% of healthcare deaths, in hospital deaths, are as a result of non-communicable diseases. So 40% of the deaths, up to 51% of admissions, are as a result of these non-communicable diseases. But what are the contributing factors to them? One, we all know, for some of the cancers, it's smoking. My grandmother used to smoke. If you guys thought it was something that we never knew, we knew she used to smoke, but she left towards the end of her time on this earth. And we know probably the smoking was a contributing factor. What if we can put, try to strive as a society to advocate for stopping this, this smoking, the tobacco use, and among others in our society? There are policy issues that need to be strengthened. I remember last year there was the move by the BAT, British American Tobacco, coming with the non the, the, what we call them, the, the, the non-smoking tobacco sources of nicotine. I, I, there's a patch on it and there's another one that you just sniff. At the end of the day, it's not smoking because we're talking about no smoke involved, no burning or anything, but there's nicotine. And when you can't afford that patch or the, those alternatives to cigarette smoking, then definitely you'll try to find the cheapest option. Tobacco comes cheap. Tobacco, the local product, you can get a bag, almost a pack that's the same size of a 500 milligram tea, tea bags at 50 bovarot, 100 at maximum. 
that is something affordable. So, uh, the cigarette smoking from the shops that we buy, five bob, three bob, these are things that are easily accessible. So if you can't get the patch which will be costly, then definitely because you've already been addicted to nicotine, you'll go to the alternative. This is going to expose as many people as possible to these non-communicable diseases, but we can act on it as a society to put an end to it. That is one of the contributing factors, tobacco smoking. Then there's harmful use of alcohol. We have drinking going on, even with COVID-19, when the bars and all the eateries were, some were locked down, the restaurants were closed. Now there's government restriction on new intake of alcohol. People are drinking from the comfort of their homes. And when you're drinking from the comfort of your home, the social drinking is not there. Because in social drinking, you celebrate with your friends. You might dr not drink much, but you'll drink a little bit of it and have fun most of the stories. Now with COVID and all these restrictions put in place, when you're drinking from your home, Chances are you might drink a whole bottle of liquor by yourself. What would be the impact? It now gets to the harm point, harmful point of consuming alcohol. What are the measures that we can put in place? What are the things that we need to do to stop that kind of intake of alcohol? We are in a society where your level of opulence, your level of rising up the social ladder is assessed by the ability to drive a car, not walking around as much, and that is causing physical inactivity. With physical act inactivity, there's accumulation of nutrients that you eat and all, you gain weight. Obesity is a contributing factor to some of these non-communicable diseases. But when you exercise and take action in improving your health, your health, is, health status, then you are reducing the risk of non-communicable diseases. It doesn't mean that when you do physical exercises, you'll be broke. You have your money, you do have it. There's no immediate correlation. But it's a, it's a matter of our mental and psychological makeup that we think we need to keep driving, we need to not walk any much because we have cars, so we can even go to the shop. Just shopping behind you, at, like in the neighborhood, you still have to drive your car to go shop. It doesn't have to be that way. You have to put in place measures that you can do, physical activities. Those are very, very important things. And other than just doing all the measures that are preventive measures, we have to put in place an advocate for access to different health promotion and lifestyle activities, and access to the care for people who need them. Start from the screening. We know people who have diabetes, they need to be screened so that they know their sugar levels after a period of time. Cancers, there are screenings that are going on. Now we know there's HPV, the cervical cancer vaccine that is in place. How many of us have advocated for the ladies in our lives, the young ones who in our lives, so that they can get vaccinated? If we don't advocate for that, they are at risk of contracting these non-communicable diseases, and when it does happen, that is the point that we'll all be crying and wishing things were different. But are we really making things different when we have the opportunity to? That's a very critical question that we need to ask ourselves as individuals and ask ourselves if we are really willing to go with the same sequence where we don't take action when we need to and we hope things will get better. They don't get better unless we act. And that is why for this year, when people are marking the Global Week for Action on NCDs, it's time to act. And how do we act? What are the shortfalls that we have in our system? One, leadership has shortfalls. We have a leadership commitment that's talking about improving access to healthcare, universal healthcare coverage, the big four agenda. You as a person, there's that leadership commitment. Has it been refined to specific deliverables? When we talk about universal healthcare coverage, what aspects of universal healthcare coverage are we talking about? So NCDs, we need access to screening. We need access to treatment and medication for the patient. Are they being provided for? If they are not, that is a shortfall that needs to be addressed and we need to work towards ensuring it is available and it has to be refined in the policy statements. Not having a blanket cover that we are going to improve access to care. Which care? Do these people have the medicines? If they are not there, then which care are you talking about? If you're talking about physical exercises, in our neighborhoods where we stay, do we have even the walk parks where people can do physical activities? I can't tell you to do a physical activity and you're staying in a crowded environment where the only thing you have is a, actually the car park. It's not even a stage because the bus stops don't exist anymore. The buses or the matatus will stop and next to the road and they even block others that are coming behind them so that you can board and move on. Without access and these social amenities, I remember last week I was seeing about act activating the different parks in Nairobi, the public parks. These public parks can act as centers where people can do physical activities. We need to champion for them to come alive 
and to enable people be able to use them as much as they can. So they need to be accessible close to where people stay and people to use them. That is from the leadership aspect. So when the leadership is talking about improving access, what are the policy measures they're putting in place? We're talking about tobacco, as I mentioned. These different multinational corporations are bringing these products, advertising them, making them look good to us and the young people especially. Are they really doing the right thing? And as policymakers, what is the implication of this in terms of the health of the people? We need to work towards a government that puts in restrictions and even taxation for such products that are not healthy for our people. And that can be in terms of taxing tobacco as much as it can, so that the finance, the money that is being recruited recouped from that taxation can now support the care for people with NCDs. Nutrition, we're talking about refined foods. We all love eating the nice foods, so we need to have fries, we need to have the sugary meals, cakes and all. They're good, but are they really ideal for us? They're sweet for us in terms of eating them, but in terms of our health, they're not the best. So we have to put in place different measures that are going to control such. Even the taxations when they're put in place, the money can still be channeled. And we have to advocate for positive behavior change in a context where we look at how people can lead healthier lives without having to be exposed to the unhealthy products in our markets. And that is a leadership commitment. And in that leadership commitment, we need to have every other person involved in making the right decision for the people who are being affected. When we started the first session of the health roundup, we discussed the health amendment bill. And the health amendment bill, there were provisions that were removing people with lived experiences from different diseases from being part of the discussion forum. That is not ideal. Because if somebody who is suffering from an uncom let's say someone suffering from cancer, cannot be part of the discussions on how to improve care, how will you know what we really need as people with cancer? If, let's say, I'm part of the group. How do you know that I need this kind of support? How do you know what challenges we, actually, we face when we are going to seek care? In the same way you're talking about improving access to people, to treatment and management for people with HIV AIDS. How do you know how to manage me if I'm having HIV AIDS without factoring my issues at a personal level? When I go to a hospital, I fear being stigmatized, being discriminated against. I probably fear being seen by other people that I'm going to take the medicines. At times I go seek that care and there are no there's no septrin. I'm being exposed to opportunistic infections. If I don't report that in the policy formulation in the leadership level, then that is never going to be factored in. And when it's not factored in, the people who really need that care will never have the care they need because their input, their involvement is missing at the level of leadership. That's a very critical bit. In terms of investment is another gap. How much financing is being dedicated to non-communicable diseases? not as much, and that is where another shortfall comes in. When you talk about financing for non-communicable diseases, we start from the screening, for management the medication. We need people who are working, the healthcare workers who are properly trained and equipped to cater for non-communicable diseases. And beyond that, catering for these services, we need people financing to ensure the different programs that are supporting them are in place. Without finances, it can't happen. Screening, detection, medicines, policies, research behind it, to ensure that people are really responding. You can give me medications, but people respond to the medicines in different ways. So that research should be tailored towards ensuring we have the best outcomes, the favorable positive treatment outcomes for patients. If that is not being achieved, we'll be losing. And the impact of non-communicable diseases to the entire society will keep piling up. However much we talk about them not being non-communicable, we are going, all going to suffer. Because we have someone who is being affected, we are at risk of being infected, getting the diseases, and the burden continues piling up. So in terms of investment, everybody needs to look at how to invest in and how to support one another. And that's why, as I mentioned about the Kasarani Health Program that we're trying to put in place on NCDs, it's a matter of the patients contributing to the kitty, even some of the healthcare workers within the facility, we need to chip in. And even at, at one point, we're hoping we can get to get people to support the initiative. Let's even have the pharma companies donate for us some of the medicines we need because these patients need those medicines to lead healthy, productive lives. Without them, they are at far much risk of dying prematurely, and when they die prematurely, the impact is, is still going to pile up into the entire system, and that is not something we would wish for at all. So it's a matter of everybody taking action. Then other than leadership and investment, we have to move to the care, care, for care bit of it, the healthcare gap. Screening services, are they available? If they're not available, we need to ensure 
what kind of care do these people need? Because once we know the care that is needed, even from rehabilitative services and all people who are drug abusers, they have addicted, and these drugs are contributing to non-communicable disease burden, there's need for that investment in that area. If that is not done in terms of the whole care spectrum, we are losing. And that is where me and you come in together and say, for people with non-communicable disease or people who are at risk, how do they get the care? And in healthcare, as I mentioned in one of the other discussions that we had, a patient is, the healthcare services cover preventive, health promotion, curative, rehabilitative, and palliative. Those are five components. We need to prevent you from getting sick. We need to promote healthy lifestyles. And in case you are sick, you need to be cured. For non-communicable diseases, most of them are chronic, so you can't get cured, but you can get rehabilitative services. And at the end stage, when you're dying of cancer, you are crying on your bed, you need palliative services to reduce the pain that you're going through. Do we have these services available for our people who need them? If they're not available, we need to advocate from each and every track, looking at what needs to be factored in the whole spectrum to ensure the burden and the pain of people with non-communicable diseases and the burden and the pain that is transferred to people who know them, who people who are associated with them, don't have to go through the same burden again. It's a very important bit of the care bit. Then the other last bit, the second last, is community engagement. It is us, I'm talking about non-communicable, but virulent. It is us as members of the community who know the pain, the suffering, and the anguish that these people go through. It is us who bear the burden of having to take care of them at their worst. It is very, the very us who are also going to contribute to whether they are taking these the unhealthy products or not. Because if I have, let's say, as my co-moderator for the session, Hezron Munyakin is here, if I'm the person going to influence him to use drugs, then I'm contributing to the burden of non-communicable diseases. And when it gets terrible on him, it will be me to suffer because this is my friend. I can't let him suffer. I have to be there for him. So it will be me letting, getting him into the cycle, but at the same time, feeling the pain of having introduced him to the cycle. Is it really realistic? So community engagement should start from the health promotion, healthy lifestyles. We need to take it out on ourselves that we have to stop the burden and risk of non-communicable diseases by actively adopting positive lifestyles and healthy living. One. Two, for the people who are suffering, we try as much as possible to advocate for investment in accessing quality healthcare services. Beyond that advocacy and adv ad advising them on how to get access to the quality care, then we now need to move towards calling on leaders and also ourselves being part of the change that they need. Encouraging healthy living by taking them out for physical activities. When we're talking about not drinking, are you drinking next to them and telling them not to drink because you feel you are safe, immune to non-communicable diseases? Community engagement covers the whole spectrum, advocating, providing the uh, adequate, the ideal system, ecosystem where they can thrive and they have the burden of non-communicable diseases being reduced. And finally, accountability. I'm accountable for my actions and I'm accountable for my actions that influence another person's actions. And at the same time, we are part of a state and a part of a governance when currently we've been looking about the, the constitution of Kenya hitting 10 years, all that, with the people, with the people. We have an accountability to the government and we have to call on the government to do the right thing when they need to do that right thing. So what's the right thing? You can't know what the right thing is unless you are informed about the constitutional mandate and the constitutional provision or even the policy provisions for different aspects of our healthcare system. So that is the starting point. Know what the different policies on non-communicable diseases state. So once you know that's the case, everybody's talking about UHC. Does it factor in non-communicable diseases? Question your policy change champions, your leaders at the local context so that at the end of the day, they contribute to that agenda. When the county financing mechanism is coming into place, it's being debated in the different counties that we are in. Are we really asking the different legislators to put in place a, a provision for financing of non-communicable diseases? Are they telling them to activate different parks and sites where people can perform different lifestyle, like physical activities? If we are not factoring such, then we'll just be talking about accountability without looking at the nitty gritties of accountability. I'm accountable for how I use my money at the end of the month when I receive my salary, but I have to know how much I have. And then where am I investing it? If you don't know how much you have or what needs to be invested in, 
then at the end of the day, month is over, you've spent all the money, you've not paid your bills, you've not paid your rent, and you've not sorted your other responsibilities. So if we know our responsibilities, we can call on people who are in power to know what needs to be serviced and at what point it needs to be serviced and even contribute to research. Because if we don't do that, we'll have been missing the point on accountability and accountability even at our personal level. And different civil society organizations are in place, different individuals, patient advocacy groups. These are in place. Where you are, you have to champion for your voices to be heard and align that voice to a particular cause, knowing that for non-communicable diseases, we have people who are patient advocacy groups for diabetes, for hypertension, for heart attack, stroke, for asthmatic groups, group COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, the mental health advocacy groups are in place. How do we align our mission towards eradicating and putting an end to non-communicable diseases or reducing the burden in our societies in these different focal points? Speak up for what you need to speak up for. Be accountable by having your facts right and speaking on what facts are missing and what areas interventions are not being put in place. Then once we factor all that, look at it from a personal point of view. Because when you're, we as human beings, we are subjective individuals, and the subjectivity makes us emotional. When you link the emotion on the facts that you've done from your research, you feel the burden. And the non-communicable diseases will not be as virulent as they are because we'll have reduced the burden and the pain that we suffer because of how far it has gone at this point will not be as much as it would be. And that is the starting point. Knowing the gaps, knowing the impact it has on us, and taking action to know that for each and every area where there is a gap, we can do something. Thank you so much. Hezron, back to you. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. David, for that insightful session. So right now we are just going to get into question and answers. And I'd like to ask our participants here on Zoom and both and also on Facebook, if you have any questions, you can just um, type on the chat box or raise your hand. Any questions, participants? Uh, so, Debbie, I think uh, it looks like we don't have any questions today. So uh, I think maybe you could say any closing remarks uh, before we just finish up. Well, for me, what I would say is we all have a role in putting an end to non-communicable diseases and lessening the burden. It's time for action. The question is, what action are you going to take at a personal level? And what, are you, what kind of agenda are you going to drive to put an end to the non-communicable diseases? What you're going to do will start from knowing the impact it has on you at a personal level. Because when we know the impact, the pain it causes to us, that is when we'll act. Remember last year when Bob Collin passed on, there was action towards addressing issues on cancers and all. But what happened? The emotional beat, the pain that we felt as a nation, as individuals, it kind of got lessened with time. Time is a healer. But does it mean we need to stop? Does it mean it was only Bob Collimo that passed on from cancer or any of the non-communicable diseases? No. That is a wake-up call that we all have to speak up. We all have to address these issues and continue driving that agenda from one point to the next. Because at one point in time, we'll achieve the win that we need. And that win is reducing the burden of non-communicable diseases, lessening the impact of it, and even looking at the different contributing factors. It's not only a health matter. When you hear about a coal plant being established in coastal region, that coal plant has a risk of exposing people to radiation, exposing people to wastes and that kind of un unhealthy environment. That is a risk to them contracting these non-communicable diseases. If we can't do that, we have to put an action. So those are very important bits that we have to do. And if we don't do that, we'll have lost the battle against non-communicable diseases. So for all of us, Let's start from where we are. Who needs help? How do we get them the help they need? 
I've seen on the comment section, the chat box that Andrew is asking, she's apologizing for being late. Starting at the village level, what do we need to do? We start at the village level by engaging with our members of the community and promoting healthy living. In our communities, we have, let's say, the barazas that are there. How do we educate people about non-communicable diseases? We have community health workers. How do we use them as agents of change in the community to speak about these issues? The healthy lifestyle, tobacco use and all, having support groups for young people. These are the channels that we can use to educate them. And beyond educating them, holding our leaders accountable. From Because at a village level, we know there are people who are selling illicit drinks and all, where the drugs are being sold. Put in place measures. And if we can start by calling on leaders to put in place the different regulatory and policy measures, it will be a win. And it starts from the community level upwards, as we stated, in the different shortfall areas, that is accountability, investment, leadership, care programs. And beyond the care program, we have to factor the needs of our society, the community engagement bit. And once we do that, it will be a win. Thank you so much for everyone who is part of the discussion. And I hope the insights that we are sharing, you can rewatch the video on our YouTube after this. Let's make a difference. Let's make our societies better by lessening the burden of the non-communicable but virulent conditions that are affecting us in each and every facet of our existence. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Debbie. Uh, there's, there's a question that I've just asked on the chat box over there. Maybe you can mention something on that with regards to NCDs. What are your thoughts on regular medical checkups for their cost? Well, the regular medical checks up, they are necessary. These are part of the screening processes, which are key. The cost is a factor because, for example, you find some of the times when people are going for glucose tree tests and all that, the blood sugar, random blood sugar tests, it costs maybe 100 or 200, depending on where you are going for them. That is a cost, and we are not in a position to afford that much as individuals. They are necessary, but the cost is there. Then the issue is you need to get them. However, we need to advocate for investment in terms of accessing them in the hospital facilities. Most public health facilities don't do them as much. Unless you are in a sick state that they suspect you might be suffering from one of the non-communicable diseases, it's used as a diagnostic criteria. But it should be a checkup that is helping you assess whether your condition is ideal or not. I remember when last year, but one, that was in 2017, 2018, when we were importing the Cuban doctors. People were talking about the primary healthcare model of care that is in Cuba that we needed as a country. Did we adopt it? Not really. We brought Cuban doctors to work in hospitals, not in the primary setting. So we need a shift in that model where we engage with the communities to lessen the cost of these medical checkups, but we need to have them. Then for the medical checkups, when you talk about regular, how regular they should be, for your blood sugar levels, th after three months, that is ideal. Three to six months, yes. For the cervical cancer as well, three to six months, but it depends with the suspicion of your risk. And then for men, the prostate cancer, that is after you're 35 or 40 years and above because they, some of them develop with age. Breast examination, it's one of the cancers. Breast exams you can do every single day as a lady or as a man in your house before you leave for your work or even after taking a shower, even, whether in the morning or the evening. You have to check your breast and assess, assess whether you probably might be having lumps or not. And those are some of the techniques and the skills that we need to know. We can monitor ourselves. For blood pressure, you go to a hospital, you're going to be assessed. Blood pressure tests, they can be done for free. And that is where you now can take advantage of the public health care system where they exist. Otherwise, if they don't exist, the difference, there are some chemists that do, some don't, but you need to get your blood pressure checked. But let's say just the normal way after three months or six months, like the diabetes test that you also go for, the blood sugar. But they are important. So even now when you're talking about advocacy, you can ask yourself, how can you advocate for these tests, medical regular checkups to be accessible to the common monarchy? Because we can't tell you that you can have easy access to care when you are sick, but when you want to get checked up so that you can improve on your lifestyle and get better without having risk of infections, then we can't provide that. Then what's the cost of that management when you wait for you to be sick? So it's a kind of a shift to look at the preventive and the health promotive component, other than the, just the curative and the kind of the, yeah, the curative aspect of it. I hope I've answered you, Hedron. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. You're so welcome. yeah, I think maybe we can end the session now.
since you're not getting any other questions here. So I'd like to thank uh, Dr. David for facilitating the session and also for the participants here on Zoom who have taken their time to join us and also on Facebook. Thank you so much. And we're looking forward to having you on our next session. So as we end today, I'd like to challenge you to go the extra mile of uh, taking charge of your health, uh, at least go, going for regular checkups or at least uh, know how the status of your health and also educate the other people in the society. So this webinar is, has been recorded and will also be shared on the uh, Reculture YouTube channel. So I'd advise you to have a look at it again if need be and also share with your colleagues who are not here with us today. So thank you so much and have a blessed look ahead of you. Thank you so much, everyone. And everyone who has been part of the discussion, it's been a pleasure learning with you.